Something powerful happens when a child of God seeks to know more about Him and His beloved Son. Nowhere are those truths taught more clearly and powerfully than in the Book of Mormon. God always provides safety for the soul, and with the Book of Mormon He has again done that in our time. Remember this declaration by Jesus Himself, Whoso treasureth up my word shall not be deceived. And in the last days, neither your heart nor your faith will fail you. Chapter 2 Wickedness and abominations increase among the people. The Nephites and Lamanites unite to defend themselves against the Gadiant robbers. Converted Lamanites become white and are called Nephites, about A.D. 5-16. to And it came to pass that thus passed away the ninety and fifth year also, and the people began to forget those signs and wonders which they had heard, and began to be less and less astonished at a sign. That phrase haunts me. It really does. Less and less astonished at a sign or a wonder from heaven. This is like um, even forgetting miracles that we've had or testimony building experiences. If we're not constantly working on our testimony, it doesn't stay. And I also, um, I've thought of, and maybe, maybe people have like, other people may have said this before too, but um, of a river, you know, you can't tread water in a river. If you tread, you're going downstream. You can't just sit and float in a river. You have to actively be swimming against the river in order for your testimony to grow. Otherwise, you're going to be carried downstream and it's going to diminish. You have to swim against the current and the current is the world. The world wants so badly to diminish what you know and what you believe and also to explain away your miracles and your experiences. And miracles do not have to be big. Miracles are every day. If we pray to see and recognize miracles, I promise you that you will see them. You'll see them and they'll increase and you'll get more and more. The past, we cannot forget. Don't be forgetful of, of all of the experiences you've had in your life that have built your testimony and given you the knowledge and the understanding of the gospel and the Savior Jesus Christ. And also the present, they were, they were so apathetic, less and less astonished at a sign or a wonder from heaven. We cannot let ourselves get that way either. And I know it's exhausting. I know, I know so many are pleading and praying for the Savior to return. But we also need to be long-suffering just like the Savior himself. That's one of the traits of charity is long-suffering. And we have to be patient and understand the Lord will not let this go on a day longer than it's supposed to. I testify that that is true. He's in charge. Heavenly Father knows exactly what he's doing. He will send his son to come at the exact right time. So the people were less and less astonished at a sign or a wonder from heaven, insomuch that they began to be hard in their hearts and blind in their minds and began to disbelieve all which they had heard and seen, imagining up some vain thing in their hearts, that it was wrought by men and by the power of the devil to lead away and deceive the hearts of the people. And thus did Satan get possession of the hearts of the people again, insomuch that he did blind their eyes and lead them away to believe that the doctrine of Christ was a foolish and vain thing. And it came to pass that the people began to wax strong in wickedness and abominations, and they did not believe that there should be any more signs or wonders given. So these people are failing right now. The past, because they forgot all of their powerful experiences, it says that they in verse 1, the people, the people began to forget those signs and wonders. And the present, they were less and less astonished at the signs. And the future, it just said they did not believe that any more signs or wonders would be given. They were faithless. They did not believe. This is dangerous. And do not let the adversary do the same thing in our lives, whether it's past, present, or future. And Satan did go about leading away the hearts of the people, tempting them and causing them that they should do great wickedness in the land. And thus and thus did pass away the ninety and sixth year and also the ninety and seventh year. 
and also the 90 and 8th year, and also the 90 and 9th year. And if you think about, I mean, this, this mirrors the ninth article of faith, because we believe all that God has revealed, all that he does now reveal, and we believe that he will yet reveal many great and important things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So that's past, present, and future. And that's, that's our core doctrine. Don't let Satan tell you otherwise. If you have temptations to write off or forget or um, not feel the hope of the future, push it out of your mind right now and develop more experiences with the Lord and with the Spirit to help recall those experiences to your mind. I promise you, anything, I tell this to my kids all the time, especially because we homeschool, anything that you have learned, my mom used to tell me this too, anything that you've learned, this, the Spirit can recall in your mind. So if you've put it in your mind, if you've experienced it, if it's in your heart, pray and ask the Lord to bring it back to your remembrance, and He will. He does. It may not be immediate, but I promise you it will come back. If you put it in there, it will come back. And also, and this is the coolest part, the things that you don't put in there, that the Lord puts in there, regardless of what you do, just because you're asking and seeking and faithful and hopeful, those things are with you always too. And those are huge gifts. But they come by effort, right? They come by us doing our part too. And thus did pass away the 90 and 6th year and also the 90 and 7th year. I read that. Okay. And also a hundred years had passed away since the days of Mosiah, who was king over the people of the Nephites. And 609 years had passed away since Lehi left Jerusalem. And nine years had passed away from the time when the sign was given, which was spoken of by the prophets, that Christ should come into the world. Remember, this chapter is covering 11 years. So they're kind of doing chunks of time of what happened during now Christ's life on the earth. And the Nephites began to reckon their time from this period when the sign was given or from the coming of Christ. Therefore, nine years had passed away. And Nephi, who was the father of Nephi, who had the charge of the records, did not return to the land of Zarahemla and could nowhere be found in all the land. And it came to pass that the people did still remain in wickedness, notwithstanding the much preaching and prophesying which was sent among them. And thus passed away the tenth year also, and the eleventh year also passed away in iniquity. And it came to pass in the thirteenth year there began to be wars and contentions throughout all the land. For the Gedeon robbers had become so numerous, and did slay so many of the people, and did lay waste so many cities, and did spread so much death and carnage throughout the land, that it became expedient that all the people, both the Nephites and the Lamanites, should take up arms against them. Therefore all the Lamanites, who had become converted unto the Lord, did unite with their brethren the Nephites, and were compelled for the safety of their lives, and their women, and their children, to take up arms against those Gadiant robbers, yea, and also to maintain their rights and the privileges of the church, of their church and of their worship and their freedom and their liberty. So the righteous Lamanites and Nephites bound together and fought for safety of their lives, the lives of their women and their children, to maintain their rights and the privileges of their church and their worship, so religious freedom, and then their freedom and their liberty. These are the exact same things like we've talked about that we need to be fighting for today and standing up for. And it came to pass that be, before this 13th year had passed away, the Nephites were threatened with utter destruction because of the war, which had become exceedingly sore. And it came to pass that those Lamanites who had united with the Nephites were numbered among the Nephites. And their curse was taken from them, and their skin became white like unto the Nephites. So the curse, we've talked about this when we covered it in Second Nephi, but the curse is and will always be the separation from God. The mark can be anything. It could be skin color. It could be a mark on your forehead. It could be the, it doesn't matter what it is. The absence of the Holy Ghost is the unmistakable mark. And so they marked that was their mark. And then they became, they, that curse was taken from them. So that mark was taken from them. It didn't matter that the mark was turning their skin dark. 
and I know this is such a hard concept to understand and my heart goes out to people who have struggled to understand this because it um, affects you personally and I know this is this is one of those parts of the Book of Mormon that are that are hard for people to um, get past, especially if it affects you personally. And I don't, there's so much that I don't know. But what I do know is that we have a merciful Father in Heaven who loves every single person the same, regardless of skin color or gender or class or nationality. It does not matter. He loves us so much. And President, I guess, Elder Maxwell said that. And so did C.S. Lewis and many other leaders and prophets who have said that if you were the only person living on the earth, that Christ would still come and atone for you because he loves you that much. That has nothing to do with gender or race or anything else except you being a child of God. That I do know. And I testify that that is true. And I also know that any of these things that we see as injustices or painful parts, there's, there's parts. I mean, growing up, I was the girl that thought, completely believed. I played college basketball. I probably have said that before. I played at Utah State. And I fully believed that I could play in the NBA. Like nothing doubting believed that when I was like, I don't know, 10 and for a lot of years and younger and older than that. Anyway, and I used to pray that I would be eight foot eight because I knew the Lord could answer my prayer if I really wanted to be eight foot eight. I fully believed that everything that a guy could do, I could do. I totally believed it. I was the fastest girl in my class. There's a one of my friends that I have not seen in like 20 years, but the last time I saw him, he's like, do you know you're the only girl that's ever beat me in a race? And I was like, I actually love that. That's true. I love that because I was super competitive and thought that was awesome. My point is, it was hard for me to accept that I could not. I will only say this once on here ever, okay? run as fast as a boy, as like matured adults, kids are different, but as an adult, there's nothing I can do to be as strong as a boy, as fast as a boy. And I don't even like saying this at all. My point is that was hard for me to figure out and to accept. It took me years, literally years. I mean, I'm playing college basketball and it's still taking me time at that point to think that, okay, maybe a guy could jump higher. I mean, they're like dunking all around, right? And I couldn't dunk. I'm 5'9". And um, I just know. And then it, and then there were some things that I thought, wait, how come I can, there's boys doing high adventure stuff at Young Men's and we have to quilt and sew all the time. And I thought that was so unfair and it was hard for me. But the more that I realized who I was and how loved I was, flaws and all, weaknesses and all, discrepancies and all, the more I felt peace and the more I just, it, it kind of melted away from me. And I know that's kind of a weak um, comparison, but for me, that was hard. And I was 12 years old watching the boys knowing that they tell gross jokes, passing the sacrament, walking in front of me. And I'm like, what? Like he gets to do that. I could do that. <laughs> and then learning about who I was to the Lord and the role that I get to play completely washed that away from me. And I'm so grateful for the roles that women have. I am so grateful. I am more treasured and more revered and more loved in this church than anywhere else in the world. I will tell you that my role as a woman in this church is valued and strong and important and cherished. And I feel it and I know it. And I, I've never, I've served in a lot of different callings and I have never felt ignored. I've never felt pushed to the side, no matter what calling is 
a tiny bit of responsibility or huge responsibility, I've always felt heard and loved and seen by the brethren and especially by the Lord. And I know that he loves us individually, regardless of any of the things that I've talked about. That was a long tangent, but I hope that that, I hope that that makes sense with what I'm trying to convey, because I know this is a really hard, a hard part of the Book of Mormon that people don't always understand. But I do know that if you go to the Lord, he's going to give you peace and he's going to help you through that part and through any part that's hard, whether it's in the scriptures or things that are happening now, this is his church. He's at the head. We are so far from perfect as people trying to run his perfect gospel. And we're trying. And there's a lot of us all over. I, everybody, we all fall short. And we owe each other more grace and mercy than we give. But I know this is his gospel and I know it is his true church. And I testify of that. Okay, and their young men and their daughters became exceedingly fair, and they were numbered among the Nephites and were called Nephites, and thus ended the thirteenth year. And it came to pass in the commencement of the fourteenth year, the war between the robbers and the people of Nephi did continue and did become exceedingly sore. Nevertheless, the people of Nephi did gain some advantage of the robbers, insomuch that they did drive them back out of their lands into the mountains and into their secret places. And thus ended the fourteenth year, and in the fifteenth year they did come forth against the people of Nephi, because of the wickedness of the people of Nephi, and their many contentions and dissensions, the Gadianton robbers did gain many advantages over them. And thus ended the fifteenth year, and thus were the people in a state of many afflictions, and the sword of destruction did hang over them. I feel that so much, in, especially in America. What was once given promises of protection, I feel like the Lord has lifted his hand of protection. The eclipse brought that and fulfilled, fulfilled some scriptural prophecies. And I think now we are ripe. I think that we're going to have a lot of calamities soon. That's not a peaceful way to end this video. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Okay, a state of many afflictions and the sword of destruction did hang over them, like us, insomuch that they were about to be smitten down by it, and thus because, and this because of their iniquity. Okay, I know that's a rough way to end, saying that I feel like the sword of destruction is also hanging over us in America. But I will say, I heard um, somebody say that conference felt like no longer just a warning. Because when you are, I felt this, and I, I said this to um, a few friends of mine, that I felt like, because I've already talked about basketball, right? I have felt like in the last few months that we are preparing for a huge game, like the biggest game of our lives. And everything that I've been trained on, everything that I um, have been working on, practicing, is going to be needed. It's going to be in effect. And also, what you do when you're preparing for a game is first you find out the game is coming up, right? So I feel like that would be the warnings. And we've been given years and years and years and years of warnings. The scriptures are full of warnings. We've been warned since President Benson was our prophet. President Benson would warn and say, we have to preserve our freedoms. We have to protect our country. We have to be obedient. We have to protect unborn babies, all of these things. And we have failed terribly. And so that was the warning. We had all the warnings. The warning means, you know, you have this big game coming up. Okay. That's step one. Step two is the training. The training. When you're in training, you are so focused on this game. You know your opponent. You know their strengths, you know their weaknesses, and you especially know your strengths and your weaknesses and where your strength comes from. And so that to me is this whole preparation for this game. First, we were warned for decades, we've been warned and centuries with scriptures, right? We were warned. And then now we're in preparation mode based off the messages that we got at General Conference just a few days ago, <laughs> we are in training, heavy training. 
and fortifications. This is right before battle when you, you see through the scriptures, the Nephites fortify their walls. They fortify their land. They fortify their lives. And can you think of stronger walls for fortification than the walls of the house of the Lord? I think every single talk mentioned our covenants, wearing our garments, and the, attending the house of the Lord, the temple. I think probably every single talk. And to me, that's why this is a game analogy. Because we've been warned, we've already know, we know the game is coming. Now we're in this time of preparation, the training time, where everything should be laser focused on this war, this battle coming up. And what's the next step? The game, the battle, the calamities come. But when we've been adequately prepared, when you go into a huge game, you're not afraid, you're not nervous, you're not worried because you know your own abilities. And in this situation, because of the Lord, so much because he is infallible. He is everything. So if we are linked to him, if we are yoked to our Savior, then we are completely fine. And it doesn't matter. And that's not promising that we will live or that we will die. I mean, we just barely talked about here, Nephi, Nephi's dad, Nephi, he said he did not return to the land of Zarahemla and could nowhere be found in all the land. So Nephi never saw his dad again. And he was still able to, what's the right way to say that? Not, not like, I was going to say shake that off, but that really like to get back up and to keep doing the will of the Lord. He's not, he's not just, you know, doubled over in distress and pain over that. He still is keep, he is still going. He keeps going and he's doing exactly what the Lord tells him to do. He is strengthening his people to protect their lives, their children, their women, their rights, their privileges, religious freedom, their liberties. And this is the same thing that, that Helaman had people fight for, that Moroni had people fight for. And the fact to me that the people in the scriptures are able to have such an eternal perspective should help us have the same so that we know that whatever happens, whether we live or die, and should we die before our journey's through, happy day, all is well. I read that scripture, tomorrow come I into the world. Imagine that scripture the other way. If our loved ones in heaven are reading a scripture the day before we get to come back to our heavenly father and leave this frail existence and they're reading tomorrow she comes back into our world that is such a sacred thought and we have to look at we have to view death differently the world has made it so scary and it, I, I mean I'm not trying to view this lightly I've lost people in my life that has brought me to my knees and I miss I miss them every single day every day and I, I just know that if we can gain the eternal perspective and put more of our trust and faith in the Lord, that we know that he can carry us through anything and everything and that he will. And that the ultimate, the ultimate end of this is in our Savior's arms, in our Heavenly Father's arms, whether we get there by Christ coming back or us coming to him first going to be okay. I only say that because I have felt prompted that we need to prepare ourselves for the calamities that are coming. And there's prophecies about um, how a lot of people will pass away in the calamities. And I pray that we can have eyes to see what that really is, whether it happens to us or others, that we just know we live without fear and we live with faith and hope and looking forward to that incredible reunion and i say that in the name of jesus christ amen chapter three gideonhai the gadianton leader demands that laconius and the nephites surrender themselves and their lands laconius appoints gidgadonai as chief captain of the armies the nephites assemble in zarahemla and bountiful is to and bountiful to defend themselves, about A.D. 16 to 18. 
And now it came to pass that in the sixteenth year from the coming of Christ, Laconius, the governor of the land, received an epistle from the leader and the governor of this band of robbers. And these were the words which were written, saying, Laconius. So the way the way that this is written is so, so patronizing, completely flattering words. And then those shift into subtle insinuations, then straight to demeaning words, then on to demands, and then promises, and also intimidation and threats. So listen to how Gideon High, this is okay. I tell my kids, bad guy Gideon High, bad guy Gideon High, and then it's good guy Gidoni. <laughs> so, if that helps you, bad guy Gideon High is the one writing this letter to Laconius. Listen to how he says this. Laconius, I have to read it that way. Most noble and chief governor of the land, behold, I write this epistle unto you and do give unto you exceedingly great praise because of your firmness and also the firmness of your people in maintaining that which ye suppose, which ye suppose to be your right and liberty. So he's basically like, that is so cute that you're, you know, I just have to give you some props here because you're helping your guys be really strong and firm on what you think are your rights. That's really cute. Yea, ye do stand well, as if ye were supported by the hand of a god. As if, right? As if you were supported. He's like, you're not for sure, but as if you were, you're kind of standing as, as if you could be supported by the hand of a god, lowercase g, by the way, in the defense of your liberty and your property and your country, or that which ye do call so. So, or that which you do think is yours. And it seemeth a pity to me, patronizing, most noble and laconious, that ye should be so foolish and vain as to suppose that ye can stand against so many brave men who are at my command, who do now at this time stand in their arms and do await with great anxiety for the word, go down upon the Nephites and destroy them. So do you, do you hear this little... Um, threat he's giving him this intimidation he's like it's it's a pity to me that that you are so foolish and vain that you think you can oppose my army that's just waiting to hear the words of my command to go and destroy you that is so it just makes me sad that you think you can stand up against us and I knowing of their unconquerable spirit having proved them in the field of battle so he says these guys are really highly trained warriors, just, just so you know. And knowing of their everlasting hatred towards you because of the many wrongs which have been done unto them, therefore, if they should come down against you, they would visit you with utter destruction. Therefore, I have written this epistle, sealing it with mine own hand, feeling for your welfare. Isn't Gideon High, bad guy Gideon High, isn't he the nicest guy? He's so nice to reach out to Laconius and just let him know he pities him for trying to stand up against him. He feels for his welfare. Because of your firmness in that which ye believe to be right and your noble spirit in the field of battle, therefore I write unto you desiring that ye would yield up unto this my people, your cities, your lands and your possessions, rather than that they should visit you with the sword and that destruction should come upon you. So he says, I want you to give me your cities, your lands and your possessions so that we don't have to come and kill you for them. Or in other words, yield yourselves up unto us and unite with us and become acquainted with our secret works and become our brethren that ye may be like unto us, not our slaves, but our brethren and partners of all our substance. And behold, I swear unto you, if ye will do this with an oath, ye shall not be destroyed. But if ye will not do this, I swear unto you with an oath that on the morrow month, so next month, I will command that my army shall come against you, shall come down against you, and they shall not stay their hand and shall not spare and shall spare not, but shall slay you, and shall let fall the sword upon you, even until ye shall become extinct. 
and behold, I am Gideon High, bad guy Gideon High. And I am the governor of this, the secret society of Gadion, which society and the works thereof I know to be good. And they are of ancient date, and they have been handed down unto us. Remember Alma telling his son Helaman, do not learn these terrible things. Don't know all the ins and outs of all these secret works of, secret works of darkness. This is why. This is exactly why, because it, it proved to be the destruction, spoiler alert, of all the Nephites, of every person, every righteous person on the earth. But they weren't righteous at that point. They had gotten really evil. Anyway. Um, but this is why, because they said it's been handed down from ancient date. And I write this epistle unto you, Laconius, and I hope that ye will deliver up your lands and your possessions without the shedding of blood, that this my people may recover their rights and government, who have dissented away from you because of your wickedness in retaining from them their rights of government. And except ye do this, I will avenge their wrongs. I am Gideon High. So this is this is a scathing letter of demands and intimidation and false flattery. I should say flattery. All flattery is false. Just flattering words. Oh, my dear Laconius, you are just so, you're noble. And he says, I give you exceedingly great praise, exceedingly great praise because of your firmness. And it's always like of what you think is yours and what you think belongs to you and what you think is, is right. So patronizing. And it's cool to note at this point that all the differences between the Nephites and the Lamanites are now based not on race, not on skin color, but on righteousness, not on color, but on commitment on internal choices, not any external identifier. That's a cool thought. There needs to be a time when we are righteous enough and building Zion together that there are no ites. The Book of Mormon is full of all these different groups of ites, Lamanites, Nephites, Ammonites, Ammonihaites, Zoramites. I mean, there's the whole book is full of ites. And when Christ comes and we're a people, that we've become a people worthy and ready to receive him, we no longer have ites. We no longer have this tribalism that we have right now with all these little segregated groups of ites. And now it came to pass that when Laconius received this epistle, he was exceedingly astonished because of the boldness of Gideon High, demanding the possession of the land of the Nephites, and also of threatening the people and avenging the wrongs of those that had received no wrong, save it where they had wronged themselves by dissenting away unto those wicked and abominable robbers. So this happens a lot. This is what the adversary does. He twists stories, right? He lies and lies and lies. He's the father of lies. The adversary is. And so Laconius is shocked because no wrongs happened to these people that left his group to go join the Lamanites, he's like, the only wrong that happened was the wrong you did to yourself. You wronged yourself by dissenting away and joining the robbers. Now behold, this Laconius, the governor, was a just man and could not be frightened by the demands and the threatenings of a robber. I love so much that they diminish bad guy Gideon High to a mere robber. I love that. He could not be threatened or frightened by the demands of a robber. Therefore, he did not hearken to the epistle of Gideon High, the governor of the robbers. But he did cause that his people should cry unto the Lord for strength against the time that the robbers should come down against them. So he knew the big game was coming. He knew it was happening. And he just prayed that they would have strength to know how to fortify themselves to stand up against these evil robbers. Yea, he sent a proclamation among all the people that they should gather together their women and their children, their flocks and their herds and all their substance, save it were in their land unto one place. So they all gathered together into one geographical location 
I think that that is a uh, foreshadowing. And I'm not the only one who thinks that. I think there's going to be a time where we are called to gather together for protection and safety. And that I, I don't think it will just be one place. I think that we'll have lots of little Zions with strengthened stakes. Yeah, he sent a proclamation among all the people that they should gather together their women and their children, their flocks and their herds and all their substance, save it were their land unto one place. And he caused that fortifications should be built round about them and the strength thereof should be exceedingly great. And he caused that armies, both of the Nephites and of the Lamanites or of all of them who were numbered among the Nephites should be placed as guards round about to watch them and to guard them from the robbers day and night. And he said unto them, As the Lord liveth, except ye repent of all your iniquities, and cry unto the Lord, ye will in no wise be delivered out of the hands of those Gadianton robbers. And so great and marvelous were the words and the prophecies of Laconius, that they did cause fear to come upon all the people, and they did exert themselves in their might to do according to the words of Laconius. So he's preaching with power, saying, as the Lord liveth, if you don't repent of your iniquities, you will be right delivered into the hands of the Gideon robbers. And these people are feeling the truthfulness of what he's saying. And so they want to repent. And it came to pass that Laconius did appoint chief captains over all the armies of the Nephites to command them at the time that the robbers should come down out of the wilderness against them. Now the chiefest among all the chief captains and the great commander of all the armies of the Nephites was appointed, and his name was Gidgidoni. Now it was the custom among all the Nephites to appoint for their chief captains, save it were in their times of wickedness, someone that had the spirit of revelation and also prophecy. Those things are so important. They're all through the scriptures. They wanted the people to have the spirit of revelation and the spirit of prophecy. And we should seek for the same thing. Therefore, this Gidgidoni was a great prophet among them, also as also was the chief judge. Remember, Gidgidoni, good guy Gidgidoni, good guy Gidgidoni, got it? Bad guy Gideonhai, good guy Gidgidoni. I know it's kind of confusing. Now the people said unto Gidgidoni, Pray unto the Lord, and let us go up upon the mountains and into the wilderness, that we may fall upon the robbers and destroy them in their own lands. But Gidgidoni saith unto them, The Lord forbid, for if we were to go up against them, the Lord would deliver us into their hands. Therefore we will prepare ourselves in the center of our lands. So he doesn't want them to be the aggressors. The Lord wants them to fortify their own lands, not go after the robbers in their lands in the mountains so the lord forbid for if we should go up against them the lord would deliver us into their hands therefore we will prepare ourselves in the center of our lands and we will gather all our armies together and we will not go against them but we will wait till they shall come against us therefore as the lord liveth if we do this he will deliver them into our hands and it came to pass in the seventeenth year, in the latter end of the year, the proclamation of Laconius had gone forth throughout all the face of the land, and they had taken their horses and their chariots and their cattle and all their flocks and their herds and their grain and all their substance, and did march forth by thousands and by tens of thousands. They had all gone forth to the place which had been appointed, that they should gather themselves together to defend themselves against their enemies." And the land which was appointed was the land of Zarahemla. And the land which was between the land Zarahemla and the land Bountiful, yea, to the line which was between the land Bountiful and the land Desolation. And there were a great many thousand people who were called Nephites, who did gather themselves together in the land. Now Laconius did cause that they should gather themselves together in the land southward, because of this great curse which was upon the land northward, and they did fortify themselves, fortify, preparing for battle, against their enemies. And they did dwell in one land and in one body. And they did fear the words which had been spoken by Laconius, insomuch that they did repent of all their sins. And they did put up their prayers unto the Lord their God, 
that he would deliver them in the time that their enemies should come down against them to battle. And they were exceedingly sorrowful because of their enemies. And remember, these are people that they knew. So many of the robbers had been Nephites at one point. So it could be family members and friends and old neighbors. And that's why they're so sorrowful too. They're not, they're not just scared. They're just sad that these people have chosen to rebel against the Lord. They were exceedingly sorrowful because of their enemies. And Gidgadoni did cause that they should make weapons of war of every kind. And they should be strong with armor and with shields and with bucklers after the manner of his instruction. That's the key word and the key phrase, his instruction. Fighting in the strength of the Lord. They're not just doing what they want to do or what they feel to do or what they naturally naturally would think to do. They're doing so meticulously what the Lord is telling them to do.